Luca wanted to ignore it. Once you get a taste for blood, it's hard to, it's hard to stuff. Well, I did stop it after last. Think, uh, I think we'll get started. So, um, I'm Erin Jacob. I'm a PhD student here at McGill in the Department of Biology. And I'm delighted to see you all here today. This is, this is fantastic. Um, many of you know that, uh, that I get pretty fired up about the kind of things we're going to hear about today. And I'm proud to say that our department, along with uh, geography, had a letter writing campaign a year and a half ago that sent 500 letters to the government about this kind of stuff. So, well done us. And it's really energizing to see all of you here today. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Katie Gibbs. And Katie is a recent, uh, a year and a half, um, PhD. And she was from the University of Ottawa. And she was working on uh, large scale um, patterns in conservation ecology. And right before she submitted her thesis, she organized the Death of Evidence Rally on Parliament Hill. And that brought three to 5,000 scientists out um, to protest changes that the government had made to science. And it was a phenomenal achievement that attracted a huge amount of um, national and international attention. And since then, Katie started uh, Evidence for Democracy, which is a national nonprofit organization that um, draws attention to the need for evidence uh, in government policy and um, promoting the use of science, particularly in Canada. So I'm really glad to have her here today. And she gave a talk this morning, so we're, uh, <laughs> I'm doubly glad because it, it's working yes. a lot into her schedule here. So uh, please join me in welcoming in Katie. Left, but ideology to rely upon. 
And this quote is from Francesca Griffo, who up until recently led the Center for Science and Democracy um, that's part of the Union of Concerned Scientists in the US. And they've been really successful at um, really turning around their science policies in recent, in recent years. And she says that science breeds the free thinking and openness to ideas that lie at the heart of a democratic society. So I think really we need to start seeing attacks on science as an attack on democracy. Much in the same way we think of uh, you know, a free and open media as being crucial for a healthy democracy, we need to start thinking about science in that same way. Having a strong science capacity and having open communication of, of science from government scientists to the public um, is, is just as essential in my mind um, to have a functioning democracy. So here are sort of the three broad reasons why we declared the, the death of evidence in Canada. So the first was reductions in the communication ability of government scientists. The second is the erosion of our scientific capacity in Canada. And the third is a diminished role of evidence in developing public policy. So I'll go through each of these and give some examples. Unfortunately, a lot of examples. So the first one I'll talk about is the concerns around that communication of science. So starting in around 2007, we started to actually see policy changes come into place in a lot of government departments. So they actually put in place new policies saying that, gov that government scientists could no longer answer um, journalist inquiries directly. They always had to pass them along to the communications department. And then we started hearing reports uh, from journalists saying that you know, they really weren't able to access government scientists um, and they were just directed to these communications personnel. And I've been fortunate enough to talk to a few of our um, longtime science journalists in Canada. We, we only really have a handful of them. Um, and so they've really seen this shift and I talked to Margaret Monroe about it and, you know, she was saying that in the past it really used to be she, you know, she's been doing this job for 30 years or so, so, you know, she knows a lot of the government scientists, and for years and years, she would just pick up the phone and call them. She had the numbers, she knew them, she would call them, um, and then there was a clear shift, where now, all of a sudden, when she would call, the same people that she had been calling for years, they would say, I can't talk to you. You have to put in a formal media request to the communications team, and maybe it will be approved and eventually I'll be able to talk to you. So there, you know, there definitely was a clear shift there. And she even used to say that in the past, it was actually the opposite. They would be you know, fighting for her attention for her to write a story about it. Because really, a story about the good science that Canadian scientists are doing, it's like the perfect feel-good story. So she said it used to be, you know, they would be phoning her up, sending her press releases saying, write about our work, write about our work. And now, now it's really the, the complete opposite. The last point here is sort of a bit more subtle, but possibly even more alarming, is that we've really seen changes to the policies around how government scientists can publish their research and how they can attend conferences. So I'll talk a little bit about of the changes in publishing procedure later, but um, the conferences is also an alarming one. Um, I've heard from many government scientists who say they can no longer attend any conferences, um, all the requests are denied. Even if they offer to pay for it themselves, the request is still denied. And you know, you guys know how important conferences are to actually doing good science, right? Because that's where you're actually learning about what's happening right now. Um, and that's where you form a lot of the really useful collaborations. So we're just not seeing that happen anymore for government scientists. So this is an example of the change in policy. Uh, this one is from Environment Canada. You can see the first line, just as we have one department, we should have one voice. Interviews sometimes <coughs> present surprises to ministers and senior management. Uh, media relations will work with staff on how to best deal with the call. This should include asking the program expert, that would be the scientist, to respond with approved lines. So often what we see happening is the journalist now has to submit a request to the comms people. Um, so then a number of things happen from there. Often it's not as clear cut that it's actually denied. They don't, they don't bother actually denying it. Often they'll just not respond. 
or respond two weeks later when the journalist's deadline is long past. Sometimes they'll respond with some written answers instead of you know, actually approving the scientist to talk to the journalist. And in the rare case where they do approve a phone interview, they'll be on the call as well. So they'll just sort of sit in the call listening, which you can imagine that's going to make it a little bit more uncomfortable for the scientists doing the interview, and they might um, be more careful with what they're saying. So this really started to make um, the news when there was three sort of really big, clear cases that this was happening. So the first example was Christy Miller, and she published a paper on salmon in science. So obviously, you know, this is a Canadian uh, government scientists publishing in one of the top journals. You know, the science journalist wanted to interview her and put a spotlight on this great research. And their requests were denied, so thankfully these journalists then uh, did an access to information request to try to figure out why this had been denied. And they actually found that it was the Privy Council's office who had denied this request. So it wasn't even you know, the manager in her department in Fisheries and Oceans Canada. This actually goes as high as the Privy Council office stepping in to determine whether or not scientists can do an interview. It's really just quite, quite shocking. Um, and then there was also the example of Scott Dalmore um, and David Tarsic. So these were sort of the three you know, really clear examples where scientists had published in the top journals. They weren't allowed to do any interviews. And then the journalists started to do some digging to find out why they couldn't and found you know, these long paper trails of government managers discussing what, you know, what the potential risks might be of these scientists doing interviews. So back in 2010, this started to you know, get some media attention. What's really interesting for me is that it actually got a lot of international media attention first before it got covered in Canada. Um, so the Canadian Science Writers Association, uh, led by Catherine Mahara at the time, were some of the first people to speak out, and they wrote um, an, an open letter to the government, you know, asking them to free our scientists, and that got quite a bit of attention. So just last year, actually, we saw some further changes to publication rules at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. So it used to be that you know when a when a DFO scientist was going to publish a paper, they had to get you know, approval um, of the managers before they would submit it. Whereas, so that used to only apply if the DFO scientist was the lead scientist on the paper. Whereas now that applies if, if they're an author on it at all. So even if they're you know, one author on a list of 10, that still means that it has to get approval from the DFO manager. So if you think of, you know, if this is a project that's being led by academic scientists and they collaborate with, you know, one DFO scientist somewhere on the list, it would still have to get approved by a DFO manager before it could be submitted for publication. So you can see how that might reduce collaborations because the academic scientists might not want to take on that risk because they don't want to risk having a DFO manager say no to this publication and have this research not be able to get out. But it's, it's just a little bit, um, a little bit odd. So last last April, the information commissioner said that she was going to actually investigate whether these new rules were actually legal under the Access to Information Act. Um, so that you know that was a good sign. Someone wrote her a letter requesting that she investigate this, and she said that you know there was at least enough there to warrant an investigation. However, I saw this article a few months ago, which I think is really telling, that she is completely overwhelmed with the number of complaints against the current government, that she just doesn't even have the resources to complete all of the investigations that are ongoing. So, uh, so she started investigating the muzzling complaints in April, so we're, we're still waiting. We'll see if and when that ever, uh, we ever hear anything about that. So this is a New York Times editorial from September. They actually compared the situation of what's happening here to what happened to government scientists under George Bush in the US, except saying that it's far worse here than it ever got there. Um, and I think this one line is particularly great. 
this is more than an attack on academic freedom, it's an attempt to guarantee public ignorance. So back in October, the uh, Professional Institute of Government Scientists, PIPS, they did a internal survey of all the government scientists, and they found that 90% of government scientists said that they felt that they could not speak freely about their research. So this is really important because it shows that those few examples that I talked about, Christy Miller and David Tarsic, that those weren't just a few anecdotes. You know, it wasn't just a few isolated incidents. This really shows that it, it, is, it is widespread. Um, and I think, you know, certainly with scientists, they tend to be sort of more conservative. And um, the way a colleague from the States put it is, you know, wherever the line is drawn, scientists tend to stay 10 feet back from that line. So the worry here with this number is that there's, there's so much self-censorship going on already. Scientists you know, really <coughs> feel muzzled, which uh, means that they're going to be you know, really restricting, them, restricting themselves as well in whether or not they're gonna talk to the media or talk out at all. So there are some other alarming stats from that. 86% um, of government scientists said they could not report on actions that might harm the public without fear of being <coughs> reprimanded. 50% said they had seen public health and safety compromised by political interference in science. 48% um, had seen information withheld, causing the public or government to be misled or misinformed. These numbers are really, are really quite alarming. So I have this just to make a comparison with the US. Often when the government has spoken about these policies, you know, they just sort of say these are common communications policies. Every government, you know, every corporation has similar policies. But it's actually not, not true at all. And the U.S. has actually been moving in the complete opposite direction that Canada has been going in. So since Obama came into power, most government departments there have actually been putting in place really clear, explicit communication policies that make it clear that scientists can not only communicate their research, but can even comment on government policy. They just have to make it clear that they're giving their personal opinion and not speaking on behalf of the government. So I always love this example. This is James Hansen. Up until recently, he was at NASA. And he was fairly well known for going to anti-pipeline protests and getting arrested. And there was one article that I thought was really great because they actually interviewed someone else at NASA kind of said, you know, what, what do you think about this? Because uh, James would actually, he would take a, you know, a sick day from work, a day off, and to go and get arrested. And the person from NASA said, you know, essentially what he does in his own time, what he does on his day off is up to him. Um, so that's, you know, complete contrast to what we're seeing in Canada, where, you know, the government's code of ethics, they're really trying to make that apply to your entire life. You know, you're not even allowed to speak out in your spare time. So it's totally different what's happening in the US. So there's no reason that we couldn't get similar policies here. So the second sort of um, broad category is the, the erosion of our scientific capacity. So we've seen this through huge um, funding cuts to many government departments, as well as reductions in the amount of government funding for academic research. This has led to cuts and closures to a lot of really important scientific institutions in Canada. <coughs> Experimental Lakes Area, Pearl, Long Farm Census, National Roundtable, and there's many, many, many more. It's a, it's a long, long list. We've also really seen a shift in the remaining funding away from basic research to really only funding applied and especially commercialization. So this chart looks at funding for the different tri-councils, and you can see that um, overall there's been about a 7.5% decrease in funding. Um, most of the decrease has been for sure, but uh, decreases all across the board. So there was that, that PIPS report that I mentioned a few slides back. They just actually released part two of it yesterday 
called Vanishing Science, The Disappearance of Canadian Public Interest Science. And so they found that um, given the, the budget numbers that the government has already put out, that between 2013 and 2016, we will actually see uh, 2.6 billion and over 5,000 jobs cut in science-based departments. So that's not just scientists, but that's um, in the science-based departments, so like uh, Environment Canada and so forth. Um, so in, they also released more numbers from that internal survey that they did of government scientists, and 91% of the government scientists surveyed felt that the cuts will have a detrimental impact on the ability of the government to serve Canadians. 69% felt that Environment Canada is doing a worse job now at environmental protection than it was five years previously. Um, and this last one is really interesting because it's the first sort of quantitative piece that we have um, that looks at you know the, the conferences aspect and uh, collaborations. And so 73% felt that new government policies um, are going to limit their ability to collaborate with colleagues. So I think that's partly the new publication procedures that I mentioned, as well as just not being able to go to conferences makes it very difficult. So this is Diane Orahel. She may sound familiar. She was a, a PhD student um, working in the Experimental Lakes area when they had their funding cut. And she basically took a leave of absence from her research and took on a full-time advocacy campaign trying to save the ELA. So I think, you know, thanks in part to her work, the ELA really became um, the sort of prime example of the cuts to science and how, you know, this really couldn't just be about balancing budgets. So the ELA was, well, is, it's sort of been saved. It's a little bit of a gray area right now, but it's really one of, you know, Canada's most significant contributions to science. Um, internationally and uh, so much important work has been done there on, on our freshwater ecosystems and so so she like I said led this you know full-time advocacy campaign um, and so I think we've I think it's been partially saved we're still sort of waiting to see if research will resume there but um, their operating budget is only two million a year Whereas it would cost millions to actually reclaim it. It's a whole bunch of you know small lakes in northern Ontario and northern Manitoba that have been used for experiments for, for decades. And so in order to actually you know close down the ELA and reclaim it is incredibly expensive. Um, so I don't you know I don't think it makes sense even just from a, a dollars analysis. Another example is the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy. So this was a sort of independent uh, think tank that was formulated to bring together environmental groups and business groups to try to come to some solutions uh, that would be good for both the environment and the economy to try to sort of um, you know, bring those two sides together. And at least for this one, in a, in a rare moment of candor, um, John Baird, who was Environment Minister at the time, was actually explicit about the fact that he was um, getting rid of them because he didn't like the advice that they were giving. So in this case, it was because they had suggested that a carbon tax would be a great way to benefit both the economy and the environment. And he said, we don't like the advice that you're giving, so why should we be paying for you to exist, essentially? And uh, completely eliminated them. So then starting in early last year, we started to hear that the National Research Council was going to be completely refocused in order to serve business. And they were saying that they wanted to make the National Research Council essentially a concierge service for business. And I think this, this quote at the bottom really sums up the government's feeling about science. Scientific discovery is not valuable unless it has commercial value. And what's interesting is then, just uh, about a month ago, I saw this. So they actually weren't joking about the concierge service. This, this is their new website. Uh, it literally is a concierge service for business. 
And so even our cuts to basic research have been making um, international news. This is another article in Nature about how Canada is cutting our basic research. And obviously, you know, we feel that this is incredibly short-sighted. Um, I think, you know, you guys probably know that so much uh, basic research does lead to innovation, um, but it's often, you know, a long, it's a long, windy road between then and there. And so while in the short term it might make sense to just focus all your money on commercializing the existing research, um, it certainly doesn't bode well for the long term when you don't have anything else to commercialize because it, it is that basic research that sort of feeds into that innovation pipeline. So and then of course the latest um, tragedy I would say that has been in the news recently is closures to many um, government department libraries. Uh, pretty much across the board, um, I think about seven Department of Fisheries and Oceans libraries, Environment Canada libraries, uh, Natural Resources Canada libraries, as well as other departments, Health Canada. So we've seen reports from, from all over the country of um, dumpsters filled with books. Um, scientists are taking whatever they can home, like just hoarding boxes of it in their garages because they can't stand to see it thrown out. We've heard, you know, lots of accounts of people taking it home, sending an email out to their colleagues saying, you know, this is a list of the ones I have. Email me if you need one and I'll bring it into work the next day. So people are almost, you know, putting together their own informal library network to try to, you know, keep this information accessible. Um, you know, especially for the fisheries um, things that have been lost, it's really alarming because a lot of it is, you know, gray literature and historical data. And so, you know, our concern is that this is really like historical baseline information that uh, is irreplaceable. If once this is lost, you know, there is no, there's no getting it back. Um, and even in some cases, in the Winnipeg Library, uh, independent consulting company saw the value of this, this work and literally brought a flatbed truck in on the day the government was getting rid of the books and piled them all on and took them away. Um, so, you know, that's material that taxpayer dollars have paid for that we've then just given for free to a, a private consulting company. So the third is uh, concerns over the role of evidence in, in public policy. So we've seen a growing list of examples where policy decisions have been made that really sort of go against the, the body of evidence. Um, and then of course there's been decisions to abandon the collection of scientific evidence based on very weak rationale. And we've also seen a number of legislative changes that really reduce the role of science and increase um, ministerial discretion. So one of the great examples of this is INSIGHT. So INSIGHT is a um, harm reduction measure. The main clinic is in Vancouver, so this is um, often what they'll do is provide a safe place for um, addicts to, to use. Sometimes they'll even um, offer the drugs for free. Um, and there's a huge overwhelming body of evidence that this is effective um, both at reducing you know, diseases that often surround addiction, reducing actual addiction, um, because if people are being forced to go there to, to get the drug, so then it, that at least gives you, it gives them a connection with the health uh, facility, so then you know, they're more likely to actually reach out for treatment. Um, but we've seen the government try to step in here and actually close them down, and they've, um, I believe, changed the federal laws to make it almost impossible for any other insight clinics to open in any other cities across the country. The second um, great example of this, which is sort of what we call decision-based evidence making, instead of what we want, which is evidence-based decision making, <laughs> is the mandatory minimum sentencing. Um, so here's another example of where this is been shown to be very ineffective at reducing crime and a very expensive policy to put in place. Even Texas tried this a few years ago and has since realized that it didn't work and, and stopped doing it, and yet um, it's what our government has decided will be our crime policy. 
And of course, um, also I think, you know, along with BELA, probably one of the, the biggest examples that really sort of galvanized the community was the cutting of the, the long form mandatory census. So that was replaced um, with the National Household Survey. And we have seen the first results from the National Household Survey come out a few months ago. And um, as all of the statisticians predicted, um, the data are useless. So I'm pretty sure it actually costs more to implement as well than the actual long-form census did, and the, the data are crap. Um, I've talked to a lot of groups who just say they're not using it, they're finding other ways to get the information they need. So, so we're paying more money for something that is useless. So in addition, uh, we've seen a few changes to legislation. Most of them happened in the omnibus budget bill that happened in May of 2012. Um, so these, the two examples here are the change to the Fisheries Act that really saw a reduction in its ability to protect fish and their habitat. The second was the um, changes to the Environmental Assessment Act. And when I say changes, um, I mean that they actually got rid of the old act completely, just gone, uh, and put in a new act that um, only, that essentially says that we only have to do environmental assessments for a very specific list of projects. Um, so it, it drastically reduced the number of projects where we have to do an environmental assessment. So for all those other projects that are no longer on the list, that means they just they don't even need an assessment anymore. They can just they can just go right ahead. So I know that list is um, a little depressing, but the only good news is that you know I think things finally got bad enough that the scientific community kind of realized that we you know, had to speak out about what was going on and what the effects of this were. So in um, July of 2012, a bunch of graduate students and professors, um, mostly at the University of Ottawa, but also Kingston, there were some people in Montreal involved as well, um, we decided to, you know, do something to speak out. And um, we decided to organize a rally, and this was also time to, to coincide with a really large scientific conference that was happening in Ottawa to try to you know, help get the numbers out. But even still at the time, we thought we would only get a few hundred people. I actually had done an interview uh, the day before the rally where I had estimated that we might get 500 people. And I got some you know, grumpy emails from my co-organizers saying, you shouldn't have given an estimate that high, and we're gonna look silly when we only get 100 people. Um, but of course, we you know, did end up getting thousands of people and it really just kind of exploded. And I think, I think it really sort of touched on what a lot of people were feeling. And I think up until this, um, part of the problem is that these, these different things hadn't really been tied together into one narrative yet. So you know, there had been accounts of muzzling, there had been accounts of closures, but each case on its own is bad, but not, not that bad. Um, it's really only when you look at all of them together and put them all in context that you really see an attack on knowledge and on science and on evidence. And so I think it really sort of struck a nerve because of that. And we ended up getting just sort of an obscene amount of media attention, both nationally and internationally. Um, it was covered on TV, radio, newspapers. Nature covered it again, and I particularly love this line. If the Harper government has valid strategic reasons to undermine vital sectors of Canadian science, then it should say so. So after we organized the rally, um, we had a lot of people coming to us saying, you know, that was amazing, what's next? And, you know, of course we hadn't at the time considered that there was going to be anything next. We thought this was just, you know, a one-off. Uh, thing, but there there seemed to be enough you know sort of interest and need to create a new organization. So so we did, and that's how we ended up with Evidence for Democracy, um, a national nonprofit advocating for science and evidence-based policies in Canada. And you know it's really interesting since I've been working on this, I've really looked a lot at what um, has happened in other countries, and most other countries do have some sort of a similar organization. Some of them even have you know two 
um, that do science advocacy and science lobbying. So, you know, I guess I just wish we had had something like this earlier so that maybe things wouldn't have gotten uh, so bad. But I think it's sort of about time that we have an organization like this in Canada. So, you know, we really see strong policies built on the best available evidence, thriving democracy where citizens are informed and engaged and all levels of government are transparent and accountable, and a nat national culture that values science and evidence and the important role that they play in society. Doesn't that sound nice? <laughs> it's a tall order for sure. Um, so we sort of see ourselves as being both um, half think tank and half advocacy organization. So we're doing some of our own independent research. Right now we actually have a, a research assistant at SFU who's doing a comparative analysis on government communication policies. So actually trying to um, assess the communications policies for different departments in Canada and compare them to other countries so that we can really show that what's happening in Canada, you know, it's, the Canada is an outlier from other major countries. Um, but as well, you know, we are doing the more sort of direct outreach and advocacy. So, you know, email campaigns and letter writing campaigns and organizing rallies and things like that. So some goals, we want to foster constructive skepticism. We want to ensure that governments are properly funding science. We want to make sure that evidence is not misrepresented in the public space. And I would add to this too, I think a lot of it, you know, it's easy to, to blame the government, but I think, you know, the scientific community has, has failed in a part by not communicating why science is so important and why the public should care. Um, especially, you know, those links between, you know, our safety and protecting the environment and protecting our health and why science is so crucial for those things. I think, you know, we all inherently understand that. And so we didn't think it needs to be made explicit for the public, um, but I, you know, I think we were wrong. I think we, I think we do have to always be making the case for why science is so important. So our first campaign that we did was uh, Science Uncensored. We did sort of a microsite and a petition around the muzzling of government scientists. Last September, we did Stand Up for Science rallies across the country. So again, you know, we decided to do rallies in multiple cities on the same day, and we thought we would maybe have four or five, and we just kept getting calls from people saying, you know, we're going to organize a rally in our city. So you know, that was really great to see that there's support for this all across the country. We've been getting great media attention so far from a lot of um, the top sort of news outlets in Canada. So I'm going to talk about two campaigns that we have on the go right now that you guys can help out with. We have a Save Our Science Libraries campaign. So that's a petition to, um, it's an e-petition that goes to the federal party leaders as well as your MP. Um, just sort of you know, asking them to halt any of the closures and uh, work to make any of the, um, all the remaining information accessible. Now this other one is really big because today is the last day. So the government has a federal science strategy right now. It's about four years old though, and right now they're planning to release a revised strategy this year. Um, and so they have their open, open consultation period right now where they're soliciting feedback on their federal science strategy. And they have a uh, sort of consultation paper to guide this, this feedback. But what's particularly alarming about it is it pretty much only talks about business innovation. So this is a federal science strategy that doesn't talk about basic research, doesn't talk about environmental monitoring, doesn't talk about health, doesn't talk about safety. It only talks about business innovation. So of course we, we think that's a little um, ridiculous. So what we've done is we have uh, we've made it very easy for the public to submit their comments. Um, you know, the government only gave about a month notice, left a month for this consultation period. They're not really advertising at all. So one of the things that we're trying to do is actually trying to, you know, let people know that this is happening and making it really easy for the public to submit their comments to it. So we have sort of a draft response on our website so that you can just, you know, enter in your name and email and hit send and then we'll submit it. 
or it's also editable. So if you have the time and have some thoughts on the matter, you can also edit it to, to reflect your, your own views. So, but today is the last day. So I think that should be, you know, your Friday night plan is to go home and write something for uh, the consultation period. So what's next? We are currently working on putting together a network of experts. So we have sort of a sign-up list on our website where people can check off what their expertise is. This is for a number of reasons. You know, one, it really helps us inform our campaigns. When something is in the news, we can quickly find someone who's an expert on it to help, you know, fill us in, um, make sure that everything that we're putting in is accurate. There's also the option there to be a media spokesperson. So, you know, I've had to deal with the media a lot through this, and often they phone me up and they're like, hey, we need a scientist for the news tonight. I'm like, okay, can, can you be a little bit more specific? And they're like, no, just a scientist. You know, any, any scientist will do. Um, and then, of course, I'm like, okay, I am a scientist. And then they're always like, really? You're a scientist? Well, yes, yes, I am. Uh, so, you know, part of the thing we hope to do with the network of experts is, you know, facilitate a better link there so that when scientists or when the media is looking for a scientist to comment on the story, we can, you know, quickly put them in touch with, with the right person who's actually an expert on that area. Um, the, the next sort of big project for this year that I think is really exciting is we're working on a really cool sort of interactive portal to really document what the losses to our science capacity have been and really link each of the examples to how it's actually affected the public. So, you know, for each example, there'll be a little write-up on, you know, what happened, what research capacity is lost, and how that really impacts people. Um, and then the third big thing is we're working with a bunch of other groups to put together what we're tentatively calling a science charter. So trying to bring a bunch of groups together to sort of come up with a consensus statement on what the problem is and what are our recommendations for better science policies going forward that could fix the situation. So you guys can help, you can join our mailing list, participate in those two campaigns that I mentioned, join our network of experts, volunteer, as I mentioned, um, SFU there was actually a supporter who went to the dean and said, you know, this is really important. Will you fund a research assistant to help with an e for d project? And they said, yeah. And so now we have a graduate student there who has, instead of TA, has a research assistant position um, looking at uh, analyzing the different communication policies. So, you know, I think that's, it's a huge help for us. It's also a really neat project. project especially you know, for students who are really interested in the science policy links. Um, and of course, you know, donate to us, because we need money to keep doing this work. Um, and if you are looking for more reading on this subject, Chris Turner has an excellent book called The War on Science, and it just came out in French this week, which is really exciting. And The Fifth Estate um, ran a documentary about a month ago called Silence of the Labs which is a great title, and so that one is um, free and online, so you can stream that as well. And yeah, that's it for me. Well, I'm pumped. We should all go to Ottawa and walk to Ottawa now. Um, for, we'll have uh, maybe 10 minutes for questions. Um, and then we're also going to go to Thompson House, uh, which is um, McGill's graduate student pub, uh, which is maybe a three minute walk away, um, for discussion over beers. Um, so please come and join us there. But uh, if anybody has questions, can you take some questions for a few minutes? Yeah, please. Uh, you guys have this hand first. Um, in a room like this, you're obviously talking to convert it, but I wonder in, in your work with uh, ED, whether you're talking to people outside of academia, and what is their state of knowledge with regards to how science has been handled in the last five years, and what are their perceptions, like how can we talk with them better to move forward this case? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question, I mean, that really is the ultimate challenge, isn't it, is how do you, how do you get it outside of the bubble? Um, so that's part of why we're putting together that sort of web portal that I'm calling it for now. Because right now there's really no place that you can direct somebody to to learn more about this. 
There's a few lists that are out there. Um, there's the, the War on Science uh, blog post. Um, it's, but it's just a long list of facilities and closures. So, you know, even for me, I don't know what half of those things, like I don't know what research was done at half of those facilities. So certainly for the average person, you know, it's just a long list. It's not really meaningful. So what we're working on is sort of, you know, it's going to be really interactive. It's going to, you know, be a map and you can click on each point and it will, you know, tell you a little bit about the research that was done there, but also really link it to, you know, how this affects you. So, you know, for the, you know, the ELA, actually linking that to, you know, do you like fishing? Do you like swimming in the lake behind your cottage in the summer? Well, you can thank the ELA for that. You know, we, we need to actually go that extra step and make those uh, make those links explicit for people. Um, so that's sort of the main the main uh, project. I think people are vaguely aware of it, um, but only sort of on the surface. So you know, certainly, we're hoping that uh, that portal will you know help um, raise more attention to it. And it's just people need to hear things a lot in order for it to really sink in. So, you know, anything we can do to keep getting media attention for the issue. And thankfully the media is, you know, they're really on our side. It's an issue they like to cover. Um, so yeah, just trying to keep media attention there so that it keeps getting out to, to the broad public.